Okay, that looks right. So hello, North Bay Python and board members and staff of the InGen Corporation. My name is Haley Dembraver, and uh, as I was introduced, I'm a software developer, and I have an interest in engineering ethics. I know this is currently a rough time for many of you, and that there is some uncertainty about the project moving forward. So that's why I'm here. I was hired to review the recent incident on Isla Nublar and catalog the points of failure and also suggest next steps for the project. My presentation to you today will consist of four major parts. So first, we're going to review the events of the weekend so we can all be on the same page working from the same set of facts. Second, we're going to dive into the flaws within our software design workflow. And this isn't going to be about any specific failure, but rather um, an overview of how we practice software engineering and where we've fallen short. So third, we're going to discuss engineering ethics and how ethical behavior um, is needed in our project and how there were breaches. And finally, we're going to cover the idea of chaos engineering, and I'm going to su suggest some steps that we could take to build a more resilient Jurassic Park. All right, so I really want us to be on the same page. So we're going to do this quick review. And for my ed edification, can you raise your hand if you've read the written account of the failure at Jurassic Park? OK, a few hands, cool. What about those who viewed the video footage? Yeah, OK, more. That's good. <laughs> OK, that helps. So as those who are familiar with both can attest, there are a number of discrepancies between the two accounts. And from my, <laughs> from, uh, my research, it's clear to me that the video footage provides the most accurate account, so that's what we're going to work with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's meet our staff. So here's our, first <laughs> here's our first consultant, Dr. Grant. He's a paleontologist, and he works with his postdoc, Dr. Sadler, who's a paleobotanist. Additionally, we have Dr. Ian Malcolm. He has a PhD in mathematics and is an expert in something called chaos theory. He details this as the idea that systems are complex and are likely to behave in an unpredictable way, even when small changes or flaws are introduced. Relevant staff members include John Hammond, who's the creator of the park, Dennis Nedry, who was the lead software developer, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Wu, who's the head scientist, Robert Muldoon, who was our game warden, we, we have some job postings, if you're, if you're curious. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also have uh, John Arnold, who was our chief engineer, and Donald Gennaro, who was our chief counsel. Now, after a construction worker was killed in an accident, Grant, Sadler, and Malcolm were brought to the park to render their professional opinions. Malcolm was aware of the nature of the park from the beginning and was consistently against the project. He was convinced that the park would never work because of chaos theory, but more on that later. Grant and Sadler were unaware of the true nature of the park and were initially surprised and delighted by the dinosaurs. Dennis Nedry was working on site to take care of software bugs. We have since learned that he was unhappy with the terms of his contract. <laughs> a while back, he was approached by a competitor who wanted to open a similar park but wasn't above bribing Nedry to steal some embryos, to which Nedry agreed. During the park visit, there was a significant storm while some of our people were on a tour of the park, and a number of systems went down, some the result of the storm, and others because Nedry purposefully brought them down in order to execute his plans. Most notably, the electric fences went down. Dinosaur-induced chaos ensued. Nedry died while trying to get embryos to the handler and was not able to resolve either the purposeful software vulnerabilities he included or the magnitude of software bugs that were there anyway. Grant discovered that the dinosaurs had been breeding, and even though that was supposed to be impossible, it was still happening. All of the dinosaurs might have been female, 
but because geneticist Dr. Wu used frog DNA to fill in holes in the genetic code, they were able to breed anyway. This is because certain species of frogs can change sex when in a single sex environment in order to continue the species. Or as Malcolm puts it, life finds a way. So they're bonus velociraptors running around and just causing extra panic. Okay. While Grant and the others were evading raptors, Dr. Sadler, with the help of Muldoon and Arnold, was able to manually reboot the power, and Hammond's granddaughter was able to uh, get the computer up and running again because she knows Linux. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, this came at a high cost because both Muldoon and Arnold were lost in this effort. So even though that part can be considered successful, it, it was a very high cost. During the incident, we lost Nedry, Muldoon, Arnold, and Gennaro, and there were many close calls. The remainder of our team, with various injuries and traumas, were able to escape once the storm had cleared, and the T-Rex and the Velociraptors were keeping each other busy. All right, so now that we're all on the same page, let's talk about software engineering at Jurassic Park. John Hammond claims that he spared no expense in the creation of Jurassic Park, but this is not supportable by the evidence. The resort is luxurious, and yes, genetic engineering is pricey, but I've determined through my research that we really dropped the ball in terms of software. So let's explore some of those pitfalls. <laughs> in this section, I'm going to be nice to Nedry, but I have harsh words for him later. <laughs> From the evidence I have gathered, it is clear that Nedry did not know he was writing software for a dinosaur park. So <laughs> instead, I discovered the requirements that he had been given. They include vague instructions like, write software to visually scan the area and report back. Write software that will dispense food at pre-recorded times. Write software to monitor a series of electric fences. Now, Nedry eventually figured out what his software was for, and he had his suspicions confirmed by our competitors, but he should have been in from the first. Hammond was trying to be competitive by keeping his plans under wraps, but he was setting himself up for failure by not giving his software development team critical information. It's not possible to properly scope, write, and test a project when you're in the dark as to the true application of the software. Is that it? Okay. In addition to not telling Nedry what the software is for, an unrealistic timeline is enforced. There's scope creep, insufficient budgeting, Nedry tried to get more money to fix the problems, but was threatened with retaliation. And when the scope creeps and the budget is blown, how much testing do you think happened? And what critical features do you think were deemed good enough without any evidence to actually back that up? So, we ended up with bugs. And don't get me wrong, all code has bugs. All code has problems. Everyone has a share of flaws, and there's no perfect. But not perfect code is a far cry from poorly designed, poorly documented, untested code running in production that includes velociraptors. <laughs> It's just not the same, yeah. So. <laughs> I want to discuss the ethical breaches that occurred as well. And it's clear to me that we didn't approach the design of Jurassic Park in a way to best ensure the success and safety of our consumers. And I also want to discuss the breaches in ethical practice that occurred because they're undoubtedly a cause of the problem as well. So who here has heard of the Hippocratic Oath? Yeah, okay. It's a pledge doctors give, and it says, first, do no harm. Who here has heard of doctors, lawyers, or engineers um, losing their licenses or being sued for unethical behavior? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, that happens, right? Uh, the reason this happens is because doctors, lawyers, engineers, um, they are accountable to the public, and um, the public health and safety needs to be ensured and certain aspects of the conception and design of Jurassic Park caused a lot of harm. And 
the public deserves better than that, and these really were a failing in ethical practice. So it's easy to say that Nedry is clearly guilty of unethical behavior. He introduced flaws into his system to exploit for his own personal gain. He accepted bribes to steal another's property. He purposely wrote his code so that it would be difficult for someone else to debug and reboot it and therefore expose his malfeasance. What he did was illegal, immoral, unethical, and directly led to his death and to the death of others. I think it would be easy to focus on Nedry's shortcomings because he's a contractor and he's dead. And, but I don't want to forget the part we had to play in this, too. And I can't let InGen off the hook. If we think of breaches of engineering ethics to only include things like sabotage and bribery, we miss the larger picture. So Malcolm, our infuriating and unapologetic consultant, was right. We thought about whether we could create this park, and we never considered that maybe we shouldn't, Malcolm was of the opinion that the park could never be safe. And while we could debate the merit of this position, it is clear that the potential for harm was much higher than originally portrayed. In the interest of financial gain, corners were cut, which resulted in decreased safety, and that's not acceptable. Ethical breaches have consequences, and in our case, they resulted in a handful of deaths, other injuries and trauma, and financial loss to multiple parties. And it could have been a lot worse. All right, so I mentioned at the start that I have an interest in engineering ethics. This is true, and I could tell you that this comes from inside my beautiful heart or pristine soul, but it's not the case. <laughs> I know, right? I am interested in engineering ethics because I am interested in resilient software systems. Ethical breaches have the capacity to compromise a system, and that is precisely what happened in this case, both with respect to Nedry and with respect to InGen. Ethical breaches are a source of chaos. They are unexpected, and their results are unpredictable. Training in and the application of engineering ethics should never be considered what our industry sometimes calls soft skills, but rather something that has the capacity to make or break your system. My final point of discussion is about chaos engineering. As we've seen, InGen's system experienced a high degree of chaos in the form of unethical behavior, fragile system design, simple bad luck, the storm compounded problems, for in instance, and velociraptors. So what is chaos engineering? If the board decides to move forward with rebuilding and reinvesting in the park, I believe that chaos engineering should be employed as part of the system design. And chaos engineering is the practice of breaking your system on purpose, observing how the failure propagates through the system, and documenting how the team was able to respond to the problem. This is essentially what happened on Isla Nublar, minus the on-purpose part. <laughs> So how do we approach this? All right, here's my first recommendation. Break things on purpose, but don't start with production. Break a dev instance, see what happens, see how your team responds. Release a hypothetical velociraptor, not a real one. Second recommendation is to sm start small and iterate. Break something small, make a prediction of what will happen, see what actually does happen, resolve the incident, and then refactor to prevent the propagation of the failure that was observed. Then you can break something else and repeat. Train your staff on incident response so they aren't scrambling around to figure out how to turn the generator on or how to reboot the electric fence. A final point to provide perspective. Another term for chaos engineering is failure injection. It might be weird to think of something that includes the word failure as a positive thing. So if that trips you up, focus on the word injection and think of chaos engineering as a vaccine. Something bad, be it viral proteins, dead or attenuated viruses, or a software bug, 
is injected into a supposedly healthy system. The system responds, addresses the issue, and then retains the ability to address the problem when it's encountered another time. It becomes stronger by being exposed to failure. Upon reviewing the events, it became very important to me to talk both about engineering ethics and about chaos. I think that these ideas reinforce each other, especially for systems that are critical. It could be argued that we have an ethical responsibility to build a resilient system when the human cost of failure is so high. Additionally, ethical practice of software engineering removes an element of chaos from the system. Things may still go wrong, but from mistake, not malice. It's my opinion that any further progress on the Jurassic Park project should go forward with these two ideas as its base, or it shouldn't go forward at all. So how do we use these ideas to build a better park? I want to close my talk with the following recommendations. Number one, appropriately budget resources to software design and testing. Number two, increase transparency between stakeholders. There's no reason Nedry should not have known what his software was going to handle. Three, hire professionals you can trust, listen to them, and make sure you have the necessary resources. Number four, don't discount your people. Jurassic Park had initially been designed to not require a lot of staff, but better software and automated software doesn't ne negate your need for well-trained, capable people to respond to incidents. Number five, use principles of chaos engineering to refine your design well before there are actual velociraptors running around. And finally, number six, maybe just don't. As Malcolm puts it, this park might have been doomed from the start. The stakes are too high and nature is too complex. Ask yourself whether you should, not just whether you can. So thank you to the board of InGen and to the North Bay Python organizers for having me here to speak. You can find me on Twitter at Haley Dunby if you want to talk more about code, chaos, or the Crustaceous period. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um.